Welcome to the first Geek Storm of January, where I myself, Sean D. Hilton, owner of Comics Cubed and one of the uh, people that helps bring you the Kokomo Comic Con, is here today with my good friend, longtime companion, eh. and uh, something, Mike Harrison. Hey. Mike, say hi, Mike. Hi, Mike. All right, so we're, uh, we're going to be coming to you live from the beautiful city of Kokomo and downtown from this lovely place we call Pepper Whistle. It is lovely. Lovely. All Delicious. right. That was enough of that crap. Ugh. So that one wasn't really good. And we're a little we're a little stale. It's been a couple weeks. So it's give been us out a break. for two weeks. You know, been having fun and just cold some craziness has happened. Some very important things. Now usually I make a joke and I say this is the most important thing. It's yeah. something silly, but we actually have like some serious type stuff. We do. And then usually I say something oh. even sillier, oh. but that's not the case this time. Oh, not the case. Lots of serious stuff. What's we've important got. that we're going to talk about? Well, I mean, we had the uh, the Charlie attack in France, which we're going to talk about that. About cartoonists and being slaughtered. <laughs> I think that's pretty important in the sure. world of geekdom. Sure. No, but okay. what is more important than that, Mike? Please inform me. There are many, many things that are more that are important in the world, mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily cover them here. We have there's we news, talk about there's, stuff. There's and news shows for that. An entire uh, company that makes cartoons, you know, they have a magazine. They they publish a political cartoon, and they were uh, shot up for it. Yes, and you don't think that has anything to do with the geeky kind of stuff we cover? I don't think so. But all right, if but you want to talk, cover? if you want to talk please, about, it, please, tell me about no, no, let's let's talk about what you think. Worthless television what show you think, that you have to talk about this week. What you please, think? Nobody tell wants us to, about it. Nobody wants to talk about the. All right, let's get to it. So what what would you watch? Because that's all that matters. <laughs> what did Mike watch on TV this week? Why don't we just change the name of the show from Geek Storm to What Mike Watched on Television? Finally. So, Mike, Finally. take it away. <laughs> well, I watched a lot of news coverage about this, uh, about this thing in France, and that's uh, really what I mostly covered. That's what I mostly watched for the most part. Let's just, do, do we, let's just eliminate the camera that one and that one and just give me that, and let's just, let's just do this for a while. 28 of the, next, of the next 28 minutes. Can we do that? Okay, good. Hey, man, I saw four movies uh, over in the last two weeks since we've been here. Four movies, and you were at one of them, and uh, it was awful. It was, it was awful. <coughs> what were the four movies you saw, Mike? Well, I'll tell you. <clears throat> I saw Unbroken. Oh, yeah. Angelina Jolie. Oh, not good. Uh, I saw Big Eyes, Tim Burton movie, Tim Burton. which was... One of my favorite Tim Burton movies because it was didn't feel like a Tim Burton movie. Okay. And then I saw uh, The Imitation Game, which was okay. excellent, great movie. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, uh, in, a, in a great story about uh, Alan Turing. Also true. All three of those true stories. Then last night we saw Taken Three. I wish I would have uh, taken the time to go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's easy. To bash a bad movie. Sure. So let's start. Okay. This is a festering pile of feces. It was awful. I love a good, bad, drop your brain at the door Michael oh, yeah. Bay action film. I got no problem admitting that. Sure. I can watch that kind of thing and go see the imitation game in the same day sure. and be more than happy to do it. I love the first taken movie. Mm -hmm. I own the first taken movie. I, I can watch it again and again and again. I think it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. The second one was uh, mediocre, but still, still watchable, and mm -hmm. it's a nice little one and two. Mm -hmm. We got to number three, and I don't know how they dropped the ball. I don't know where it went off the rails. It started with the very first scene, which didn't matter. the The plot is, and you know this. There's no spoilers. His wife is killed. Right. You know this is because it's in whatever few trailers that trailer. they actually put out. Right now, Liam Neeson's old. He is. Now, I don't necessarily mean that, that you can't do action movies anymore, because right. obviously Taken 1, he showed that that kind of cool, collected, laid-back style worked. Right. But in this one, in the very first scene he's in, which is a chase scene, mm -hmm. and I don't even know if it was him or a stunt double, there was no energy. At no point in time did I feel the thrill 
of the chase. At no point in the suspenseful sequence am I like, what's going to happen or whatnot. I didn't care because he's going so slow. Right. You know, they were doing, it wasn't parkour by any stretch. No. But it was him like jumping over really tall fences right. and this and that. Right. But even those felt like, holy cow, my fat tubby ass could have got over the fence faster than some of these guys did. Yeah. And it appears that all the cops in, I believe this was in LA. Los Angeles, yeah. all of them went to Stormtrooper shooting school right. because he was shot at at least a dozen times and nobody even grazes this guy. Yeah. Just, it was low energy. Right. In the first two movies, even though he's got that cool laid back style, high energy, very fast paced, going from here to there to there and here. This one, man, the whole thing just felt like you were on a Taken movie in slow motion. The first one to me was definitely a Liam Neeson, he's, he's a tough guy movie. And it's about him. And this one was very much a an action movie that they threw Liam Neeson into me. He was there was there wasn't anything in it that his his character couldn't have been substituted with somebody else. You know, uh, like you said, there was well, he he. There's a scene where he's running. There, the, he he goes through some underground uh, like a storm sewer, and he ends up in the Los Angeles River, which is that dry cement bed. And uh, which he, is a river. Yeah, no, it's a river. It's a uh, river just covered in cement. Right, uh, but they uh, he starts to run, and it just looks like this old dude running. You know, and he's just. You know, it looks so labored, and uh, what you were saying about that that scene, the kind of half parkour scene, uh, that and the car and the very first car chase, especially the the editing was so uh, quick and choppy and staccato that uh, it was like they didn't they were trying to hide from you what take what it takes to get from up there down those stairs and down into that room. They show you a picture up there. They chop, 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 and then they show him down there. I, and and you're supposed to expect that it, that it, that that's what happened. I have played video games that have a better motion capture kind of feel of getting from the top of a yeah. you know roof down to a street than this movie did. The story was not only was the action just there was not that much. It didn't feel like any of the action mattered. It yeah. wasn't exciting. You were bored. Right. The story was horrifically bad. Now the truth is it's taken is you know the first one they kidnap his daughter, he goes and he finds him. Right. But he's tracking down stuff and right. he's you know dealing with stuff. This was just like wow what first off and I you and me you know you, you have not, you're not a fire you're not a policeman. No. But you, you know those guys a little bit. Sure. We're not police experts, but I don't believe that you get to illegally wiretap a citizen right. in the first three seconds of meeting them. Right. It was just, I mean, just nonsensical crap from beginning to end in a nonsensical style movie, but then everybody's acting like idiots. There was a lot of things that would never stuff. in a million years happen. He poisons his own daughter at one point right. just to make her <laughs> nauseous enough so that she'll go to the right. bathroom. Right. Who, unknowingly, since she was pregnant, he may have, he may have hurt that baby. Okay. <laughs> That's so, very possible. Let me help you out. And drink this. <laughs> in the very end, uh, much like uh, Harrison Ford, he uh, he figures out who the one-armed man is. Sure. He proves that he didn't, in fact, kill his wife. Right. The 50 other people that he slaughters on the way to proving that he didn't kill this one other person, yeah. including tons of cops, yeah. civilians, and maybe some bad guys. We don't know. Some were just poor bodyguards that had hired on the day before for right. minimum wage right. and were, you know, getting... But the most disappointing thing beyond all that and talked about it every single movie is they always introduce the fact that he has got buddies and he was part of some kind of team. Yeah. We finally get to see the team. Yeah. The most un, just so anticlimactic. They don't do the one, anything super cool. One of them is barely in it. One of them is in it a little and he disappears. And then the other one that's actually in it in a few scenes, he ends up getting shot and, and killed. So. And the best guy's not even in the movie. Yeah. They didn't bring back, um, oh, not JD, uh, DB. D.B. Sweeney. D.B. Sweeney. Oh, okay. Who's in, he's yeah. always in those scenes. Yeah, yeah. So finally, I love D.B. Sweeney. Yeah. I'm like, finally, we're going to get, wait. We fi There's no D.B. Sweeney. I get my guys, and I didn't even get D.B. Sweeney. This, here's my, the, my oh. biggest eye-rolling moment of the movie was. Um, it's got to be the car. No, it was when he's, uh, he's making his way to this penthouse or whatever, and there's a guard shack or a guard, uh, a guard station in, in one of the buildings. And um, there's a guard in there who knows somebody's out in the hallway. Okay, there's been gunfire, there's been explosions. So he, he, he creeps out in there, he looks, he looks around, he looks down, he sees his, his dead buddy, guard buddy, laying on the ground, and then he goes around this way. Well, then you see Liam Neeson, who I believe is like six foot three and probably oh, 250 geez. pounds at least. You see him roll out from underneath this guard that was laying there. So like he had a guy laying on top of a guy 
And somehow that, that uh, just a normal sized guy, not like a big guy or anything, and, he, and he, he was hiding under the other guard and he, you know, and they shoot him. That was, that was just ridiculous. And that's just, that's just one of my, the four or five times I rolled my eyes. two cringeworthy moments. One, the very ending was just horrifically cringeworthy and not necessary. They introduced the fact that his daughter is, is possibly pregnant, right. probably pregnant, right. depending on whether the strips are accurate or not. Frankly, <laughs> I've never had to find out. But they also introduce her boyfriend right. slash fiance or whatever. Sure. Jimmy. Just long Timmy. enough for you to think, wow, maybe there's going to be like a little, you know, die harder kind of thing where mm -hmm. he's going to team up sure. with this guy. Maybe he's got a cool path. No. This guy is completely superfluous to the entire thing, doesn't need to be there, and then shows up at the end just so after all of this action and mom's dead and she's pregnant. If we have a daughter, we're going to name her after dead mom. Yeah, that's nice. That was the end. That was I was nice. like, that's it. That's what you got. Taken 4 will be about somebody oh. kidnapping the baby, the newborn baby. Oh, it was just uh, bad. No, I think I, as about. much as I love them, they need to be done. This was so, and it was by the same director who directed two, but it was, it was not best, by it was the best same director. Normally who did the first solid. One. Normally solid with the action. And oh. uh, well, Luke, Luke's not involved in either of them. He didn't direct any of them, it turned out. I went oh. and looked it up. He was producer, writer, oh. all that. So he was heavily involved, but he did not direct these. Direct okay. None of them. I thought he did. But so, take a long story short, really long, but man, who's such a giant disappointment? Do not bother going to see Taken Four because it was horrifically bad. And not even excited. Three, four. You know what? It doesn't matter. It's, just, it's bad. It's so bad. Now, you said the best movie I think you said you saw was The Imitation Game? Uh, yes. Follows the gentleman who, the English guy who ends up breaking the Enigma code. Yes. And creates basically the first <clears throat> super, well, first computer. Right. He has a team, but he's definitely the guy that made the first machine. Because, uh, and hopefully everybody here will watch this movie, but it, it makes you realize how tough it was. Because we've seen movies like uh, U571 where, oh, they captured the Enigma machine, now things are going to go well. Well, this shows you there were, there were years after they captured that, uh, that machine that they had the machine there. But the Nazis were changing the code every single day. So they had until, let's say, 6 a.m. in the morning till midnight-ish or so to try to figure out what today's code was and go through millions and millions of possibilities and then use whatever information they might have gotten, which they never did, uh, before midnight because they would change the, the Nazis would essentially change the key to the code every single day. So, uh, so that's where Alan Turing came up with this. Well, I want to I wanna build a, uh, a machine that will not just break the code, that will break Enigma, that will figure out how Enigma actually works and, and then do it for us. So, <clears throat> and it was very good. And there was, uh, in his backstory, you know, he, he was uh, a homosexual and in, in those days it was against the law. And so uh, that was one of the, you know. Well, depending the, on where you are, it still is. Well, that's probably true. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the writing on the screen at the end of the movie uh, tells you what happened after this and everything. It, it was a tragic story, but uh, some, it showed the number of, of men who were, uh, were prosecuted, and he was one of them. He was made to be, uh, this is after it was broken and everything, but he was made to be on a uh, chemical, chemical, castration. chemical castration for a year uh, before he took his own life. Uh, and uh, that was, you know, that lifted on a really down note, obviously. But he did, uh, he did, he and his team did break the, break the code. And, but then, and you think, okay, that's the end of the movie. Cool, we're going to see that scene where they tell us, you know, what actually happened. But then they get into the fact that the scientists, who were mostly mathematicians, had to then come up with what they called a, he, and a really cool line, he called it a, this, we have to do this blood-soaked calculus in which we decide, we've broken the code, how many people do we save, which people do we save in order to not let the Nazis know that we've broken the code? Sure, it makes sense. So, because uh, if they, you know, start doing every, they break if they bust in every single operation. Yeah, we're going to know the Nazis change the code. And now we got to right. So they say, okay, well, if we save, let's say we can save 300 people here, but we're going to lose these 100 people here to, to keep the illusion going. Then that's what they did, and so they they came up with some calculations in order to uh, be able to. Save the maximum amount of people, but shorten the war as, as much as they could. And somehow they estimated that breaking the Enigma uh, machine um, allowed them to shorten it by two years. So that's a lot, obviously a lot of lives saved, but uh, really, a really good show. And Benedict Cumberbatch is, is great. And I'm not a big Kiera Knightley fan. She's the female in, in the show, but she wasn't in this movie. She wasn't like the sex pot or anything. She was, she was uh, you know, kind of a smart uh, uh, scientist woman. <laughs> and uh, so 
she was different, and I liked it. I liked it quite a bit. It was a really good show. It's got a limited release right now, so to get to see this movie, you're not going to be able to see it in Kokomo. Right. Because we have incredibly limited selection of films that AMC believes that Kokomo will watch. Right. We've got 12 theaters. We do, and they're filled with the same kind of crap you'll always see. Right. So I've got my little top 10 breakdown of the top 10 uh, movies at the theater. Okay. Three weeks in a row, The Hobbit is killing everybody. For three weeks? Three weeks, wow. right there. Three weeks in a row, whooping up on absolutely everybody. I like this. It's my favorite of three. Into the Woods, a new musical, it's number two. Don't really have Coming in with some strong money there, not bad. Unbroken, Angelina Jolie came in at number three. Uh, but I'll tell you what, the surprise for me right here is number four. Woman in Black 2. Now this is your you know, typical horror movie sequel. The first one had Daniel Radcliffe, who right. starred in all the Harry Potter films as Harry Potter. Right. But this doesn't even have him in it. It's like 40 years later. These movies are fairly inexpensive to make. I don't know the exact budget on this one. It is a period piece, so the, uh, it might be, have a little higher budget than some of the normal ones, but still. I, can't, I bet I, it was under 30 million. I, oh, I'm sure. But I can't, I can't believe anybody that saw the first one to go and see the second one. It was, the first it was one was so good. boring. So boring. Okay. Night at the Museum comes in at five. That's Ben Stiller, probably the last entry in that. Annie, which Sony was back in pretty heavily, comes in at number six. The Imitation Game hard knock life. Yeah. makes number seven. But it's only on limited theaters. So, it is, so it's but wild. still, it's pretty, pretty impressive. Yeah. Hunger Games sticking around for seven straight weeks at number eight. The Gambler, which is the new Wahlberg film. It's only been out for two weeks. Oh. Already down to number nine. I still, I do want to see that. Whew, it's getting it. It's getting his butt kicked. <laughs> and then Big Hero 6, which has been around for nine weeks and is making all the money in the world, comes in at number 10. Actually jumps from a number 11 to number 10 jumps to get up. back into uh, making some more money. So there you go. Those are your big movie money makers of the week. This week, I assume it'll probably be taken. Um, super cold out there right now, which you know seems silly. I think it's going to hurt. One, I don't think it's going to make a ton of money. I bet it comes in at like 25, 20, 25 million. Maybe. So that's where, and I don't know. What else is coming out this week, you guys? I thought American Sniper was coming out. It's it appears next week. next week now. Yeah. Even though our local AMC had had it playing this week on their up to, if you check their names and stuff. So thank you, local AMC, for letting me down. You know what else I saw? What? Please, tell that me. That we talked about? What we talked uh, about? It. Whiplash. I did not get to see that yet. Oh, it's so good. Oh, it's so good. I wish you I told you about Invitation Game, told you about Whiplash. I didn't get to see either. You saw them both. Kind of yep. hurts. Yep. Hey, it's really good. Is it? Yep. <clears throat> Simmons, is it Simmons? J.K. Simmons. Oh, love yeah. him. Yeah, he's uh, he's probably going to get a uh, best uh, supporting actor nominee nomination. I would I would guess. Um, oh, is he only supporting in this? I thought this was like his his movie. Uh, no, it is. No. I, I believe it's he is the um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, Miles Teller is that his name. The guy's going to be in. He's going to be Reed Richards in the new Fantastic Four movie. Okay. Uh, kind of curly haired uh, young kid. Uh, he's he's really the now speaking of that yeah. I'm under the impression and I could be wrong because some of the stuff we get just you know it's Facebooky and I don't do impressions um they've like released a date for Fantastic Four 2 or something <laughs> well, all right. I'm like wow that is optimistic good on you <laughs> you know go Sony because wow yeah I am not looking forward to I'm gonna go see it yeah. but that Fantastic Four movie Looks nothing but bad. To Look me. for that in theaters right after Catwoman too. That would that's Woo! what that's what I would that's what I would Man, do. Man, you go Sony, make that fat cash. Right. But while we were at the movie yesterday, the uh -huh. best part of it, other than the fact that we were out of the freezing cold, right, was the Ant Man trailer Seeing full size big screen. on the big screen. Right. And wow, very excited cool. about that. They're being real stingy with the uh, showing Ant Man in costume, and the only times you've really seen him is just really quickly, and you see. See the costume a few times. You definitely, and you don't see the villain, uh, Yellow Jacket. Um, but it relies heavily on uh, on um, Michael Douglas, and uh, they go for a couple co comedic beats at the end with uh, with Paul Rudd. But I think it's going to be that type of movie where he they've uh, they've switched up the credits. Uh, originally, Edgar Wright was uh, the writer. Now he has dropped down to story by, and now Paul Rudd is getting one of the writing credits. So I'm right. assuming that they either ad libbed a ton or he actually, you know, sat down and scrubbed up the script after Wright had left, and did a major, did enough of a rewrite that producers are going to give him a written by credit with a couple other people now. So it's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, the Michael Douglas thing, rumor has it, and this, I'm a little weird about this one. The way I've been hearing stuff, he was already Ant Man. He was Ant Man. He was an adventurer. He had gone out and done stuff. Mm -hmm. But in the Avengers movies, we definitely get the impression that they're the first that have done this stuff. So it makes me wonder if Michael Douglas's version of Ant-Man has maybe been a secretive, spyish kind of a something. character, yeah. and they've you know hushed it up. Right. Plus, I mean, 
and where there's no rumors of this whatsoever. It's just a fanboy. Hank Pym is supposed to be one of the greatest inventors in the Marvel Universe, right next to Reed Richards and probably more impressive actual technical wise than Tony Stark. Right. Tony Stark just happens to have a little new toys. Bill Gates is probably what, you know, I'm not that techie, but you know, right. I would say Bill Gates is probably your Hank Pym, whereas uh, Steve Jobs, who had a lot more charisma, probably Tony Stark. But I mean, we, we need to have those two meet. You need to have Michael Douglas and Robert Downey Jr. in character, like, you know, having a little debate about, well, you ripped me off. Well, you ripped this off. Well, you ripped it off from that or something. And I don't think I would guess, see that. I would guess that Tony Stark has never met Hank Pym. That'd be my guess anyway, but who knows? I don't know, but the preview looks very interesting. A lot of fun, as you said. We don't see him a lot, but you do see like the one integral kind of thing you need to see, and that is he shrinks down, right. he's got the stuff on, and he jumps on a wasp. Sure. Which in the comics is how we always got yeah, around. Yeah. And you got to think, you know, as a fan, as I'm like, how are they going to make? Are they going to be able to make that look cool? Because right. that's going to look really, really stupid. Right. When he jumped on that stupid wasp, that was cool. I was like, that's cool. You, you did it right. <laughs> it looks neat. The lighting is perfect. The way it's moving, the motion looks good. Uh -huh. The way he shrinks and moves looks good. Uh -huh. And they chose the right guy, because in the history of the Marvel Universe, there's been a couple of different Ant-Mans. Right. Most of it, it's, it's Hank, right. uh, Hank Pym, who's been Ant-Man, Giant-Man, Yellow Jacket, Goliath. Uh, Goliath. Yeah. He's shrunk, he's, 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 he's got it all. big, he's done it all. Scott Lang was a thief. Right. And so I think with this, you get a tale of redemption. Scott Lang was a family man. They definitely made sure they, they put that into the movie, so mm -hmm. he's got the daughter. He's got all the things that make a Marvel thing a little better than maybe a DC thing. Mm -hmm. Realistic human things, you know, guy, single guy with his daughter, hard on his luck, trying to get by, and now here's this opportunity. And that makes for a much more interesting story than just, you know, kind of a cookie cutter perfect thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully it'll be a lot of fun. New comic just came out. We're going to talk about that next week. Okay. So, and it looks like yeah, Scott Lang had actually died in the Marvel Universe. So, of course, they've got a movie coming out. So, he's back. Sure. So, did you read any comics this week, Mike? Nope. Why not? You took some. You got some. I saw, I saw you. They're still in my folder. That's sad. Yeah. Well, I've got some. So, All let's right. talk about them. Good time. The end of the new Amazing Spider-Man. You have uh, what... Uh, Dan Slott said he was going to break the internet. There was a lot of crap about that. Pretty, pretty shocking ending with oh, the does? reveal of... I don't know, I'm worried Who's the only dead guy in the Marvel Universe that can't come back? Uncle Ben. Yeah, but he's in... Is it an alternate universe, yes, it is, Uncle absolutely. Ben? Um, it absolutely is. Nobody's going to so, go crazy about that. So I don't think it's as big a deal, but it was a good little page turn. Sure. So Wolverine's number one. Wolverine has been encapsulated mm -hmm. in Admantium. Now dead. Lost his healing factor a long time ago mm -hmm. in the comics. Finally is dead, but Admantium, Admantium? Adamantium. Adamantium mm -hmm. is worth more than gold, right. more than platinum. It's sure. like the most valuable thing practically sure. in the Marvel Universe. And he's covered in like a giant statue. Okay. So they got to go in and get that because you can't just leave that much, you know, Admantium right. just rolling around. Right. So you've got all these characters that have history with Logan. You got Sabretooth, Lady Deathstrike, X-23, and his son, Dakin. So two of those, one's a clone, one's actually biologically his. Mm -hmm. Lady Deathstrike had like a mad fascination with him. And Sabretooth is like a, almost like a half brother, you know, kind of thing. And they're like Stepbrother. Team Wolverine? They are our Team Wolverine, wow. basically being forced by four other Weapon X people mm -hmm. with a really stupid storyline. Um, really, it's a weekly series, gotta say, probably a pass. Okay. Wolf Moon. Wow, that sounds not good at all. Vertigo, really good, really good put together. It's a suspense werewolf kind of a thing. Kind of looks like Andy Dimmitt. The idea behind it is really kind of different. The idea is that the werewolf-ism, mm -hmm. like, ah, you're going to be a werewolf. Mm -hmm. No. The werewolf thing is some kind of virus, and it jumps randomly to separate people every month. Wow. It is never the same people. So some guy here in Kokomo gets werewolfism. The next week, it's a guy in Brazil. You have no clue. It never had to have met. It's some kind of weird thing. Mm. So it's a guy going around who turns out he was the werewolf for one month, and he is trying to track down and kill the, whoever's going to be the next one, hoping to just stop it finally so that it doesn't affect anybody else. I see. Probably the best book of the week, The Unbeatable Squirrel Girl. Wow. From Marvel. Uh-huh. One of the, uh, the most underrated characters of all time, Mike. You probably know her from the Great Lakes Avengers. She has got all the powers and abilities of a squirrel. And in this 
Well, fun. Hey, what are the powers and abilities of a squirrel? Well, she can speak to squirrels. <laughs> she can talk to squirrel. Of course. She can climb uh -huh. fairly well. Uh -huh. She skitters, and, skitters up a tree in a serpentine pattern. Yeah, oh yeah, and which wow. makes it very That's, hard to hit oh, her. Oh yeah, no question. She, she moves around a lot. Sure. Jumps, uh -huh. leaps, uh -huh. and has, of course, uh, you know, squirrel strength. Does she have a tail? She does have a tail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking. That's great. But the book is uh, is in a manner that the art and whatnot is very kid friendly. <clears throat> it's kind of got this uh, whimsical kind of feel to it. A lot of fun, and of course, you know, she's got to take on the big bad. Sure. So. Sure. So it's a lot of fun. It's a it's a family friendly kind of a book, and whereas you know it's, they, I had somebody come in. They were talking about Squirrel Girl at, at Comics Cube, mm -hmm. and they wanted to be serious about it. You know, like well, I can't take, I don't want it because, and they're like coming up with this reason like if you don't want to buy a comic, I don't care. Yeah. I'm not gonna ever make you buy anything. But they're like giving me reasons why blah 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 blah. And I'm like, dude, if you're taking Squirrel Girl seriously, right. you've chosen the wrong path in life. <laughs> so it's a book about a squirrel girl. Right. So if you can't just get on board with it and have some fun. Was it was she bitten by a radioactive squirrel? How did she get her squirrel powers? You know, we haven't had that origin in oh, here yet. Gracious. I'm sure that they have told you somewhere. Stay tuned, we'll we'll cover so, that next week with the But French you know what? Shooting. It was fun. She goes to college. Oh, the idea is that Good. she has been. I did not mean to bring this back up. Can we move she on? She was living. She was squatting in the Avengers attic because <laughs> she had uh, been able to get in uh -huh. by uh, using her squirrel powers. Of course, they can get in anywhere. And uh, does she keep? Does she store food in her cheeks? You know, for, no, for, I don't for, think so. But she does have pretty pretty thick cheeks. Yep. I mean, she's. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, you see her. She's like yeah. going down the chimney, not yeah. like Santa. But to get what else you got there? What else is in that thing. pile? And then she what hides else? her tail in her pants, which gives her a, uh, a bootylicious booty. You know, she really shake, ought to shake what her mama gave her. Lady Killer. Uh -huh. Completely opposite direction. Sure. You've got June Cleaver as a, uh, as a hit woman. Oh, wow. She goes around killing people. She's got a family. She sells Avon or whatnot. That is in my folder. I'm gonna, and I'm gonna uh, it's, a, it's a fun little book, but it's, it's, it's kind of got your dark... Mystery, suspense thing. Ooh. It's a little like that Gina Davis uh, movie with uh, Samuel Jackson. Um, Long Kiss Goodnight. Love that movie. Now there's great a great movie. action movie. Great movie. With some fun stuff going sure. on. Kind of like that, but a period piece. Right. So. Okay. And then Avengers No More Bullying is almost a PSA. All right. It's well put together. It's only a buck ninety nine. Oh, that's a Full good deal. size book from Marvel. They had to give that and, away. And uh, they should have. Should have been like a free comic book day book. Mm -hmm. and, but as you can see, I can't show you to this, but great art sure. through you know, the Hawkeye story where it's Hawkeye being bullied Aww. by the rest of the Avengers. Aww. You know, I'm the weakest guy on the team. Right. And of course he saves the day. And right. The whole thing is your affirmative messages about, you know, don't let the world bring you down, be a good right. friend, bullies and all that nonsense. Okay. So there you go. All right. That was uh, some of the weekend comics. I don't know, did he just flip me off? No, he said he had three minutes. Oh. Would you got something before we get into Lego Week? Oh, I, I yeah, I get a yeah, a what lot, got? a lot before we get what do you into, got? into Lego Week. Hey, check out on Netflix. Mm -hmm. There's a um, season two of Marco Polo. <laughs> there apparently is going to be a season two of Marco Polo, so you know, good luck with that. I'm not going to watch it. Uh, there's a documentary called um, Legends of the Night, K N I G H T. We tried to get that to play here in Kokomo a while back. There was a big push. They right. They got enough. I, it does go around. It does make the print makes rounds and and they play it for charity and and to raise money for charity. But um, it was really good. I, I kind of expected it to be kind of cheesy and, and, you know, maybe not making fun of the people that dress up, but at, at least really not cover it in the right way. And they, they, they covered several different people, several different stories about people who dress up uh, mostly as Batman. This was, this was very Batman-centric. And, and, Hence the title. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, there was a lot, also a lot of backstory in there, too, a lot of history about having how the movies were made and things like that. Um, but mostly it was mostly inspirational about uh, how the, these people that, that uh, will dress up and go to hospitals or, or, uh, or just try to make a difference in their community. And, you know, some of them look a little nutty. I'm, I, even for me to say that, that's, that's true. You know, there's some of them that, that to me, kind of go overboard. But uh, they're having fun and they're trying to help out people, trying to help the community, trying to make kids forget they're sick for a little bit, uh, that type of thing. So it's really and a really well done uh, documentary. So check it out on Netflix if you get a chance. Um, and the other thing I was going to say real, very quickly was on uh, um, on Epics. Epics is, is a cable channel. It sure is. Uh, well, it is. I believe you. EPIX. Uh, there was a really good uh, five, um, five episode series. Uh, it was an interview series 
called uh, Leading Actor, Supporting Actor, Leading Actor, Supporting Actress, and Directors. And it is, uh, it's kind of a round table with the people that are probably going to be nominated in, that, in those areas. And uh, the Leading Actor one was uh, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, um, Botch, uh, Michael Keaton, and um, Eddie Redmayne, and I think um, Steve Carell. Those are those guys. And it was just a really good conversation just with those guys. You know, kind of like, do you remember watch Party of Five? Not Party of Five. What was the? Dinner for, Dinner for mm -hmm. Five? Dinner for Five. I'm going to laugh at my... Party of Five. Yeah, Party of Five. Yeah, I bet you watched a lot of Party of Five. I never watched Party of Five. <laughs> Dinner with Dinner for Five. John Favreau. Whatever. Anyway, it was a conversation with actors about acting, and I, I really enjoyed it. And every, you guys should check it out. It's free online on epics.com. Uh, Next week, we'll have in some special guests to talk to you about video games and, of course, Lego Week. We will have. Oh, we didn't have time for Lego in, Week? That's oh, okay, because we're going to spend all next week Did I push? talking about Lego Week. Uh, okay. You didn't even have to show up. Oh, We've got like, real people who want to talk about real things, including. I was real talking about real things. Legos. Thank you for checking us out. We hope you check out the next Geek Storm, and while you're at it, stop on by Comics Cube, buy some stuff, stop on by my friends over at Kokomo Toys, check out Goblin Games, and of course, stop by Pepper Whistle for some lovely lunch. Lovely. Have a beautiful day.